The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went around all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And he cured every sickness and disease. When he saw the crowds, he was moved with pity, for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are only few. Ask the master of the harvest to send workers to gather in his harvest. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So now I'd ask Dr. Jim McLaughlin if he will uh, speak to us on tonight's theme. Uh, I was sick and you visited me. Thank you very much, Brendan, for the kind words. I didn't realize you were going to eulogize me or I would have uh, had the decency to die beforehand. Anyway, Brendan asked me uh, to talk a wee bit about what it's meant to be a doctor, spent my adult life as a doctor. So all good stories begin once upon a time, and mine began 50 years ago this coming July. I qualified in medicine, a fresh-faced young man with an abundance of dark hair, an hour before our graduation ceremony, the head of the medical school arranged to meet us all in a nearby lecture theatre where he read out the Hippocratic Oath. We didn't take it as a formal oath as such, but he asked us to reflect on it and make it the base of our future practice. He'd had a cl classical education and so had a bit of Greek. Uh, so he wrote three Greek words and Greek lettering on the blackboard. Uh, I couldn't understand it, but uh, he told us, thankfully, what they were. He reminded us, as I said, as one of his favourite lines, that the practice of medicine is based on three loves, or three fills. Philosophia, love of the art. Philotechnia, love of knowledge or science. And philanthropia, love of humanity. If I can backtrack six or seven years to when I was at school, and considering what career I would choose, I was torn between medicine and engineering. When my big sister became a medical student in the year that I was studying for A-levels, I knew which way to jump. I was most certainly not going to walk in her shadow. I applied to study engineering, but almost immediately regretted my decision. I thought about what mark I wanted to leave behind me when I passed on from this life. I knew I liked meeting people and I, I wanted a job where I could work with people, yet wanted to be remembered after my death as someone who had accomplished something positive for humankind. I'm not saying I couldn't have accomplished a lot of good as an engineer, but medicine attracted me really as never before. But then I still had to convince that same professor why he should accept me to study medicine. I'm not sure what I said, but I must have spoken with conviction as I was offered a place the following October. So to move forward six years to my first night working as a junior doctor in the Matter Hospital, I had at least some of the theory at this stage, but when I found myself as first on call for more than 150 patients in the wards, I was terrified. What terrible thing was going to happen that I might have to make a major diagnosis or have a major intervention and make decisions that might do harm to someone? That first night turned out to be fine. No one died and there were no momentous decisions needed. But within a few short weeks, I found I was able to assess, diagnose and make appropriate decisions on behalf of several patients and possibly help to save some lives or at least deal with their problems efficiently. I can recall within the first few weeks of working, uh, I was working in the casualty department and a young child arrived in casualty having fallen off a slide in the playground. He had been knocked out. <clears throat> this was in the days before there was rubberized padding on the playgrounds. He had fallen onto concrete. 
He recovered consciousness before the ambulance arrived, but I just felt a bit concerned about him, and a sixth sense kept calling me back and forth to reassess him, even after he'd gone to the ward. And when he started to get, become grumpy and sleepy, I was even more concerned and contacted the on-call consultant. He was transferred to the neurosurgical unit, where he had a clot removed from the side of his brain, a thing called extradural hematoma, but I'll not uh, ask you to repeat that. He made a complete recovery. This was long before there were any CT scans or MRI scans, and one had to rely mostly on clinical judgment and simple x-rays. That sixth sense, I realised, <clears throat> was a part of the art of medicine, the philosophy, where a patient's need was gleaned by asking the right questions and by examination. Throughout my career, I have found that feeling in my bones made me reassess a particular patient and perhaps diagnose something not so obvious initially. I see it as part of the art of medicine. It's not un infallible, but I think that growing up in my practice of medicine before we had such scientific and technical support as there is nowadays, a sound clinical judgment has been a great, great bonus. I admire my GP colleagues who have to work much more with their clinical and interpersonal skills without immediate access to the close technical support. Which brings me to the fills again. The second love or fill, philotechnia, is the love of the science of medicine. It's a reminder of the fact that medicine is a science as well as an art. Increasingly, we use blood and other fluid analysis, scans of various kinds, and endoscopy tests to assess, confirm, and treat a variety of conditions. Most of these techniques, scans, and modern treatments did not exist when I qualified 50 years ago. But I need to keep ahead of new developments so that I can bring the best of med modern medicine to bear for the benefit of my patients. I remain formally registered with the General Medical Council and with my professional college to maintain my knowledge as up-to-date as possible. I undergo annual appraisal uh, to check out that my knowledge and standards and all the things that I do uh, remain as up, to, up to scratch. Although I stopped working full-time several years ago, I have continued to help in the NHS on a part-time basis to help keep waiting lists in check. But that was before we heard of coronavirus or COVID-19. Although I am a doctor, which some people think will keep me completely healthy and immune from disease, I have managed to pick up a few health problems along the way, some possibly related to the high stress job I've, I've been doing all my adult life. So I was chased out of the hospital when coronavirus arrived. Uh, because of the high risk of death if I should catch the virus, and I really haven't worked since last March. I was, however, very conscious of the potential doomsday scenario we were facing when the pandem pa pandemic started to bite, and I particularly attended a large number of online lectures on the virus, the complications in the car of those hospitalised with COVID-19. If the worst happened, I would be ready to step into the front line despite the danger I would be exposed to. I have now had the first dose of vaccine and have said I would help with the waiting lists when services restart for routine procedures. In the meantime, I volunteered in November to become a vaccinator to insist on the rollout of the vaccine. I have completed all the required hours of training and volunteered for some sessions. Which brings me to the third fill. Philanthropia, love of people or humanity. I have had the privilege of meeting treating and walking with so many men and women through difficult times of their lives. Much of my work over the years has been involved in caring for those with chronic, often progressive diseases. Many patients carry their crosses with great fortitude, showing amazing acceptance of their illnesses. I think I'm probably not as brave as many of them, and they represent a challenge to accepting God's will. I have diagnosed and treated them for the relevant illness, but no one person is just a disease. Each is a living, breathing person with hopes and dreams, fears and anxieties. Scripture says, do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you. So I try to treat each one with the respect and dignity that I would like myself or one of my relatives treated. Having said that, to function as a doctor and give good advice, it is necessary to keep a degree of emotional detachment and weighing up the options and giving the best advice. 
hence the ruling over several years from the General Medical Council that except for emergencies, doctors should not treat close relatives and friends. But it's also important to show my patients that I care about them as people, not as a disease process. So complete emotional detachment is neither possible or even desirable. I would feel the loss, for example, if someone died despite my best efforts, especially if I got to know them uh, and had been looking after them for some time. It is especially important to show that I care and feel for them in a situation where I, ha where I have to break bad news to someone, perhaps to parents of a young adult or a young mother or an older person with his or her family. I would set apart some time so the meeting is not rushed and I speak to the patient in company with a family member away from the main ward so that others will not be able to observe their discomfort and maybe even distress. I ensure that there is a nurse with us who can hear what has been said and subsequently explain it in more detail if needed. I would often say a short prayer inwardly beforehand and ask that I can find the words to be as gentle as possible. I try to see the situation speaking to one that Jesus called the least of my brothers. I try to imagine that I am hearing the news. The message may be the same, but the sensitivity and empathy with which it is delivered can, I believe, affect how the patient responds to what is happening. In the situation of hearing bad news, the special tenderness and sensitivity of many of the nurses I have worked with over my career has been a great inspiration to me. I have been inspired in other ways by many of the colleagues I worked with, including doctors, nurses, and others who gave up so much, give up that ex to give the, go that extra mile for patients. Uh, I, I was only once, I'm afraid, I, I did go to Lourdes. So my wife and I travelled to Lourdes, the pilgrimage in Lourdes, where I assisted with the care of some patients. But I discovered there that I knew many of the doctors, nurses, and other volunteers who gave up a week of leave and quietly cared for sick people in Lourdes year after year, not making a fuss, but getting on with the work to be done. I'm afraid I find it extremely hot and uncomfortable, and I find the heat too oppressive, yet these people endured it yearly. Recently, uh, during the pandemic, I still did some ex did my exercise. I was out for a walk, and I came across a road accident where a pedestrian had been knocked over, but did not appear seriously injured. A small group were gathered around, and I pushed my way through, saying, I'm a doctor. I discovered there already was a young doctor, and no fewer than three nurses already giving attention to the man on the ground. I can only assume that a desire to help people in need has been instilled into all of them also. These are the same people who, like all NHS staff, have risked their very lives over the past year during this horrible pandemic. Over my career, the nature of the relationship that doctors, including myself, have had with our patients has changed. In the early years, it used to be quite a paternal relationship where the doctor understood the disease process and told the patient of the planned investigation and treatment. That regime no longer exists. The patient and doctor are now jointly part of the team, which often includes other health professionals who are involved in the planning of treatment too. People are so much better educated than they were in decades past, and the route forward is planned jointly with mutual respect. As a Catholic doctor, I am steeped, uh, and I would even say almost marinated, in respect for life. I have always sought to follow ethical principles that respect life. I cannot and would never support euthanasia. Only once in my career has a patient asked if I would help to end his life. He was over 90 and I had just made a diagnosis of inoperable cancer. I explored his concern which was based on his idea that cancer meant dying in intolerable pain. I explained to him that whilst I did not have the legal right and would certainly not even wish to end his life, I would do my best to ensure that any pain or distress that he might have would be relieved. He died peacefully in a hospice. That said, whilst I would not actively kill a patient, it is an established ethical principle that a doctor does not need to strive excessively to prolong life at all costs. Ethical issues are too complex to go into in a short talk, but I will always act in my patient's interest 
but without actively ending his or her life. Mine has been a tough career with long and stressful hours of work. Maintaining a work-life balance has always been difficult and my work has probably been the biggest source of friction in my marriage and family life. For most of my professional life as a consultant, I worked on a one and three rota with prospective cover. What that means is we covered each other's annual or sick leave, so it really was closer to two and five. We had a touring caravan which we used for our summer holidays, which we towed out of the Troubles down to County Kerry, but on call often prevented us having weekends away before that. Our three children often grumbled that their friends were having a break over a holiday weekend. There was a bit of huffing and puffing, and I would feel bad about it, but they had to live with it and they learned to. And it is interesting, the two of the three trained as healthcare professionals. The third, guess what, became an engineer, the profession I would have ended in if I would not decided to take the chance that I could persuade the professor to accept me into medicine. Incidentally, she ended up studying for a PhD, so can now be called doctor too. By local standards, I was relatively well paid, but in the same job in the south of Ireland, I would have earned about four times as much. In America, probably eight or ten times. During the height of the Troubles, my wife and I considered emigration, and I even used my holidays to work as a locum in Canada for a month, where I earned many times what I would earn at home. After I returned, we spent a long time discussing it and decided to stay here in Belfast so our children would grow up knowing their grandparents and the rest of their extended family. They all grew up with a warm, loving relationship with their grandparents and would still recount fond memories they have of them. Even when they all reached adulthood, they still loved their remaining grandparents dearly. So family relationships are a much higher priority to me than earning the big bucks. I had an official nine to five job with an additional one or two nights per week on call uh, and I said two weekends out of five. Over the weekend, the person on call would go into the hospital to assess all the new admissions on both each day, Saturday and Sunday, plus anyone that the junior doctor was concerned about. It would have entailed roughly four or five hours work in each of these mornings. Outside that time, I had to be available for telephone calls from whichever junior doctor was in the hospital. Before there were mobile phones or long-range bleepers, I had to remain accessible by giving the time that we would be at a particular location. After some years, I did get a bleeper. It meant going to find a phone to contact the hospital. I remember during a very solemn part of the preparatory ceremonies for my daughter's confirmation, my bleeper went off. The children in the classes involved were asked next day about what the ceremony meant to him. Almost every child referred to Catherine's dad having to leave when my bleeper went off. Mobiles made things a lot easier. The phone would often ring during the night and I would try to sleep lightly so that I could jump quickly and grab the phone before it wakened everyone in the house. If I had to go into the hospital at night during the troubles, my wife would get me to ring when I arrived safely and ring again before leaving. One night I was in for quite a while, arriving home at about 6am to grab a nap before going in for my normal day's work at 8.30. She was rather surprised when I told her I had been best man at a wedding. I had been called to assess a woman in her 30s who was dying. Medically, I could just give advice on keeping her as comfortable as possible. While I was talking to her, she pulled the oxygen mask aside and asked me if she could marry her partner. I saw no reason why she shouldn't, so I phoned the priest, who was the chaplain on call, and we had the wedding around the woman's bed in a corner of the ward. The staff nurse and I acted as witnesses. Uh, the poor woman survived for about 48 hours and then died with her new husband beside her. This has been one of the more unusual incidents I have experienced in a long career. It has been a fulfilling life and I hope that when I pass on, my family, the world and the final almighty judge will be able to say that I have indeed left that positive legacy behind me that inspired me to enter the medical profession more than 50 years ago. <laughs>